Hey YouTube, welcome to the Archer Reptile Ranch. Today we're going to be doing a slightly different kind of video for two reasons. The first reason is what we are looking at is not even a reptile. It's close, it's an amphibian or a few amphibians, but also in order to truly appreciate the animals that are in this enclosure here, we have to look at them at nighttime when they're at their most active stages and active points. Because during the daytime all they do is cling to the walls. Bear with me, this is an experiment. We're gonna use the light from my camera as well as this light. Now that I've blinded everybody out there, let's wait for these lights to turn off and we'll have a look at the Vietnamese mossy tree frogs. Okay, the lights are out. Now it's going to take a few minutes before these guys are active. And that, folks, is how we begin every night in the room here, where I keep all of my arboreal herptiles. So first we'll talk a little bit about this enclosure. This is set up in the style of a polydarium. You can see that it's a fair amount of water on the bottom, and there are large pieces of driftwood in here with mosses growing on it. I have an air plant. Some of the plants back there are fake, including the flowers, uh, but some are actually alive, like that pothos, this uh, sword plant right here. There's a couple of spider plants in here. There is a Monte Carlo vine that's not doing the best in here. Also living in here are a couple of neon tetras and there's some ghost shrimp down in here. In the water, there are some plants that are growing pretty well, including duckweed. I finally mastered the care of duckweed. I've also got a CO2 pump that puts a little bit of carbon dioxide into this water, which is very good for the plants that are in the cage and growing. With any cage that has a lot of humidity, something else that's very important is airflow. So while I'm able to maintain this enclosure at 87% humidity most times, and in the low to mid 70s, I have a computer fan up on top that plugs into a USB port. So it's just like charging your phone and it doesn't use much more power than charging your phone. But it pulls air out so you have the little vents down here so it pulls and keeps air flowing through here so it doesn't get stagnant which helps prevent the growth of mold. I also have springtails and small dwarf isopods crawling around in here. But that also helps with the bioactivity of this enclosure. Now I mentioned to truly appreciate this species, you have to see them at nighttime. During the daytime, they flatten themselves out and try to hide as best they can on the back wall, in the moss, on the cork bark back here. But if I zoom in, you can see, oh, he just jumped actually, but you can see their body posturing is so much different in the evenings and at nighttime. So here's one of them. You can see uh, their incredibly cryptic pattern. In addition to a very cryptic pattern, they have a very bumpy skin. It almost looks like a toad. It's very warty, but these are, no doubt about it, a species of frog. In fact, this genus comprises about 11 different species, some of which were discovered as late as 2006, and others only being described and recognized a few years after that. They've been known to science, but they just weren't accurately described and some of, the, some of these species fall into that. There are other mossy frogs, a smaller type of mossy frog. There are frogs that look like cork bark almost. Some even look like bird poop in this genus. The genus is Theloderma, and these particular ones are Theloderma cortical. While they are a mossy tree frog, and behaviorally act very similar to red-eye tree frogs and other monkey-legged tree frogs, these guys are also kind of semi-aquatic. That's why I decided to set them up in this polydarium. These guys, like typical frogs, are carnivores. They eat anything smaller than themselves. But when you're keeping some of these, I've heard they can even cannibalize one another. So you wanna make sure that your colony, if you have more than one, are in the same size range. They do have a call. It's a very high pitched, very short call that I hear from these guys some nights. And it's, it's not too irritating. I mean, my bed's only about five feet away. It's never really disturbing. As their name suggests, the Vietnamese mossy tree frog comes from Vietnam. They're also thought to inhabit as far north as China and into Laos. These guys can be found at elevations from 2,000 to 3,000 feet up in the mountains. 
Because they come from higher elevations, these guys need cooler temperatures. You don't want to keep this like a tropical rainforest. You want it to be wet, but cooler than you would for most of your exotic reptiles and amphibians. This enclosure is maintained at about 75 degrees. That fan, along with helping move air, also helps it stay cooler in here. It, it, it definitely helps the water evaporate and add humidity and coolness because the light fixture up there, while it's not meant as a heat source, it definitely gives off some BTUs. If I don't have that fan on, the temperature rises to about 83. They can tolerate that for short periods, but that's not a good maintenance temperature for these guys. Keeping these guys in the 70s, even high 60s, is ideal for this particular species of frog. We'll try to zoom in and have a look at this guy up here on the leaf. He is on a pothos leaf. Now, having never done a night shoot before, this video may not be the best quality. Let's see what happens when I turn my headlamp on. Okay, that does help some. Uh, see the light came on and it said, hey, I think it's daytime again. Time to stop being active. So I'll go ahead and uh, after I show this guy off a little bit, you can see his head up there and his eyes reflecting the light in that top right corner. I'm gonna go ahead and turn my headlamp back off, give, make them more comfortable. I don't feed these guys every day. Usually about every other day, I'll offer them food. With a setup like this, one obvious concern is drowning crickets. You know, you've got the water flowing through there and lots of it. Crickets just jump and bounce everywhere. And then if I'm feeding them roaches, the same thing. These guys love the dubia roaches just as much as crickets. The method I've learned from Josh's frogs is to take one of these cups here, a feeding cup, and I just put their prey items in here. It sits on top of the water and it's kind of like a big white plastic lily pad. The frogs see the moving bugs and they jump down there and try to get themselves a bite. Now, of course, it's pretty amazing that these guys are so recent and new to science and also new to the hobby. They've only really been kept since uh, the mid 2000s. I remember the first time I saw one at a reptile show was probably 2008 or 2009 and I was blown away. I'm like, what is this thing? Wow. And it took me about, yeah, about 10 years before I finally got some for myself. It's not that they're hard to find, it's just uh, it took me a while to get around to rediscovering and acquiring these guys. One of the bad things about being so new to science is there's very little literature on these guys. There's a good Reptiles Magazine article that I've read on them. Uh, there's a couple pictures in the more recent TFH books on keeping frogs. And there's a really good article in uh, the Manchester Frog blog on this species. Of course, Josh's Frog sells them and they have a pretty good write-up on the page, the purchase page, so you kind of know what you're getting into and you know the basics. LLL Reptiles sells these guys. They're, they're pretty widely available and I've seen them for sale. Their prices range anywhere from $55 to $95, depending on who's selling them, whether or not they're captive bred or not. I'm gonna turn the lights out again and give them some prey items. Again, this is a method recommended by Josh's Frogs and it seemed to work out pretty, pretty well for me. I've moved the frog out of the top corner so that I can open this up. And what I've prepared is a meal of some crickets down here. And of course I lightly dust them with calcium and multivitamin. But you'll notice once it's inside here that I also gave them a little piece of food to kind of keep them interested and stay in that one spot. I mean, if they want to go somewhere, they're crickets, they're, they can do so. Um, but usually the, the, the rim lid, helps keep them where they need to be. And I can already see that one of the frogs, if you look right about here, let me open this door to him, but you can see his head is cocked and turned and he is ready to get these guys. We're gonna go ahead and turn all of the lights out and give them a minute or two, get into their nighttime groove. Then we'll see if we catch anybody eating. As I mentioned, nighttime is when they're naturally active. And you can see their body postures are reminiscent of what you would see in drawings, paintings, and photographs of other uh, tree frogs. Up here on the stem of the flowers, you can see how he's positioned himself. <laughs> Meanwhile, the little one has decided uh, it's too close to daytime. I'll hide again. 
with this great nighttime shot with all four in frame, I'm gonna sign off, close up these doors, and let the frogs do what the frogs naturally wanna do. And they will continue to be part of the collection of reptiles and amphibians that live here at the Arctic Reptile Ranch for quite some time.